How are you? From 10 to 1, 10 to 0. Jonathan Glazer's new short film, Strasbourg 1518, is probably my favorite movie of the year. This is, this is a complicated year to pick a movie of the year. It's likely that the lockdown we're all currently under is going to be continuing well into next year. Film as an industry has been wrecked and gutted, with even the biggest budget releases going directly to home video. More than just the business changes, though, it's a year which has utterly obliterated my ability to consider art in the way I normally do. The way that we often talk about art is an impossibility created in the 20th century, largely as a result of photography and museum curation. We can go see a painting in a clean, silent room against a pure white wall and experience it as though it were a singular object in the void. When we see a movie, and certainly when a film is reviewed by critics, it is seen in a dark room with no presence but the screen, taken in a form so pure and removed that we can imagine there is no world beyond it. There is no longer the experience of a work being unseen and unknown until we walk towards it, seeing it only in one place at one time, fixed into a greater world around it that we cannot shut out. One of the greatest works of European religious art is the Eisenheim altarpiece and it is impossible to view in this way. It was sculpted by Nicholas of Hagenau and painted by Matthias Grunwald in the year 1516, and installed in a monastery in Alsace whose monks cared for victims of skin diseases and the plague. It depicts Jesus, larger than life, in one of his most tortured and gruesome crucifixions, covered in sores and lacerations, his wounds modeled on the patients of the monastery so that they could see a Christ who suffered as they did. It is one of the most harrowing works of art of its day, a portrait of pain and suffering. But more than anything, it is a portrait of sickness. In the early 16th century, Alsace was experiencing a series of health disasters. Years of bad harvests, the highest grain prices in a generation, starvation, the continent's first outbreak of syphilis, and resurgences of both plague and leprosy. And all of these are reflected in the suffering of the altarpiece, their symptoms so clearly and accurately painted that they can be diagnosed today. It is a work that cannot be cleanly extracted from its place and time and audience, a work intended for those plague sufferers in that hospital during those outbreaks. There is a medieval prayer, the De Morte, which was almost certainly sung around this altarpiece. Media vita in morte sumus, quaem querimus agitorum. In the midst of life we are in death, of whom may we ask help? But the Eisenheim altarpiece is also a work that was designed to be fundamentally unstable and impermanent. 
On festival and holy days, the piece was opened up down the middle, revealing another set of paintings inside. The crucifixion is unfolded to reveal the birth and life of Jesus, and in the final wing of the painting, his resurrection. It does not deny death, degradation, decay. His corpse is still visible at the base, and the inclusion of a chamber pot makes this perhaps the only Renaissance painting to admit that Jesus had to piss in a bucket. But the dominance, the centrality of death to life can be inverted. In the midst of death, literally unfolding from the middle of the crucified body, is life. The painting is death hidden within life, or life obscuring death, both impermanent. The church and the calendar and the plague surround the work like the mirrors of a telescope, focusing meaning down onto the altarpiece as though they were concentrating rays of light. It's no longer possible to see the Eisenheim altarpiece as its creators intended. I mean this both in the literal sense, it's a work designed to resonate with the worldview of an illiterate Catholic peasant with a skin disease, but also in that this transformational element of it can't be done anymore. The altarpiece has been moved to a museum built out of a converted medieval church, where it was disassembled so that it could be displayed in its entirety without damage to the paint and structure that continued opening and closing would cause. It is now displayed as a work of art rather than liturgy, viewed for aesthetic rather than sacramental purposes. No masses are performed surrounding it, no prayers are sung. There are no holy days on which we as the audience can witness life emerge from the shell of death. The intent of the piece is still clear, but the way in which it is meant to be experienced is lost. And that was so fundamental to the work itself that its meaning is now transformed. The Eisenheim altarpiece, as it used to be, no longer exists. Part of being a critic is being impersonal and removed. It's a hard balance to maintain, to write about the effect that a work of art has on you while having to imagine the effects it has on others. You have to picture an audience, try to imagine how this work functions under ideal conditions. I can't simply tell you how I feel about a work. I need to explain what that feeling means and how it will make you feel those things. We are supposed to view art the way the Eisenheim altarpiece is viewed now, rationally, in as close as possible to a curated museum space, with an awareness of context that informs but does not intrude on the work itself. No one now would expect an art critic to talk about a painting while only seeing half of it. No critic would be satisfied being turned away and told they have to come to a hospital to view a painting and are only allowed to actually experience it in its intended manner on certain holidays. Life is short and art is long, as the saying goes. A work will continue to exist for years, days, centuries outside the conditions that created it, and those of us who talk about art feel the constant temptation to make our criticism outlive its time. The modern ability to view art portably, decentralized, through photography or streaming, means that our standard mode of approaching it is without context. I can download a game through Steam on my laptop, take it anywhere in the world, play it at any time, and I have to discuss it knowing that this is the case for everyone else who plays it. I have to treat art as an object floating above the world, tethered to it but not of it, or risk making my criticism feel impermanent and irrelevant. As all the emails I'm getting from companies from whom I bought one thing three years ago say, in these uncertain times, I simply haven't found that to be possible. I cannot be an unfeeling critic. I am choked on feelings. The art that I have experienced and thought about during this lockdown, I've done so in a context that overwhelms all attempts to rationally place something in its place and time. I've played lots of great, thought-provoking video games, but how can I discuss the way Pathologic 2 uses plague as a way to force players to consider how games handle choice and responsibility 
When the sensation of playing this tragic, horrifying game while my own society buckles under the weight of a mismanaged pandemic screams so much louder in my ears than any of the clever Brechtian theater tropes that I want to talk about. I thought about doing a video on the fun and lightweight art I've consumed that's provided relief and distraction. I've been watching a lot of cheap 80s anime lately. But how can I really say, you should have a couple of cheap beers and watch some Dirty Pair, it's a surprisingly charming and earnest show, when I know that every moment of pleasure I got from watching it came from the escape it provided, from it being a loud, dumb, and silly shelter from the world. How do you praise the beauty of a fire escape without talking about the fire? Okay. Okay. I will talk about Pathologic 2. In the game, you play as Artemy Burak, Russian army surgeon and a folk healer who has come back to his hometown, only to find his father dead and the town succumbing to a plague. Except, not really. The story of the game is explicitly set up as a theatrical presentation, and you play as a series of actors who step into Artemy's role, with each death marking the end of that actor's performance and the ascension of a new understudy. Except, also not really. You play as yourself, a person playing a game where they play as actors playing a surgeon. At times, characters in the game will address you directly and ask what you think you're supposed to be learning, forcing you, as in the works of communist playwright Bertolt Brecht, to acknowledge that the play is an artificial construction from which you are supposed to derive a new way of understanding the real world. It's an amazing piece to talk about as a critic, because the game demands that its players also be critics. It interrogates players on their own interpretations of the play, and constantly reminds them that there is a meaning bigger than just Artemis' story. The game can be punishingly unfun. Its own difficulty options describe the intended experience as, quote, nearly unbearable. But it's the rare game that recognizes that interpretation, that meaning-making, is an act of play in its own right, and encourages you to find joy in analysis. The real question at the heart of the game is, how do you survive death? Not, how does the body or the individual soul live on after death, but how does one live in the same world as death? How can death itself be defeated? One answer is through a sort of benevolent annihilation of the self. Artemy cannot really die because he is many people, just as we cannot really die if we are part of a community, if more of us lives on in other people than in ourselves. As you die, the game counts these deaths in a secret tally. It chips away at your stats, but also it builds a monument to your death. Outside the theater where you and your director discuss your performance before starting anew, slowly a massive bowl starts to assemble itself, larger with every death. Every time you die, you return to the theater, and you and the play's director pick apart the work a little more. You can discuss art, you can analyze it, you can come to grand conclusions. And the bowl gets bigger. You can engage in every form of intellectual consideration and thoughtful dissection, but you will have to go out that door, back into the plague-filled air, where every day the tally of the dead grows higher, and outside the playhouse the monument to death grows bigger and bigger and bigger. There is Artemy in his plague, and the actor playing him, surrounded by their own plague, and me playing the actor, surrounded by my plague. The altarpiece folds in on itself over and over and over. In the midst of life, we are in death. Who even cares about some pathetic Burach? Living, breathing, boring Burach, while a whole 400 others die this night.
Let us return to Alsace, then, if we cannot shake the specter of Eisenheim. Two years after the altarpiece was put up, about 45 miles away, the city of Strasbourg in the year 1518. Conditions did not improve in Alsace between 1516 and 1518. Leprosy, plague, ergotism, an unknown disease called the English sweat and syphilis still ravaged the region, as did famine and poverty, and in the city of Strasbourg, a new plague started. A woman began to dance, and, except for occasionally sleeping, she did not stop for six days. Her neighbors joined her. The dancing spread like an illness, seemingly with no cause or cure. Local authorities attempted to exhaust the population and built a stage, hired musicians, and kept hoping the dancers would wear themselves out. Sources say that as many as 400 people joined in the dance over the course of at least a week. Later historians claimed that people danced themselves to death, although the evidence for this is tenuous. There are theories about why this happened. Food poisoning caused by the same fungus that LSD is derived from was one of the most popular, but the most common historical consensus now is that it was simply human suffering and misery reaching its breaking point. Similar dancing plagues were reported to have happened throughout the Middle Ages, almost always coinciding with an outbreak of other physical diseases, and especially with the bubonic plague. People reacted to poverty, sickness, and death with mania, exuberance, unbridled play to the point of injury and chaos. Death and decay unfolded into joy and celebration as they uncontrollably rejected despair and, probably without even wanting to, danced. The dancing plague was not a disease, but an escape. In the midst of death, they were in life. Jonathan Glazer's new film revisits this moment. Strasbourg 1518 is a mostly wordless collection of dancers, set to a song by Glazer's frequent collaborator, Mika Levi. There is no end to the dance. The dancers are still moving when the camera stops and the song continues over the end credits without interruption. The figures are alone, isolated, in rooms that are empty or nearly empty. Our current pandemic is never mentioned, but haunts every inch of every frame, just as leprosy and plague haunted Grunwald's crucifixion. The sterile rooms populated by a single figure are quarantines, and will look like them forever, as those of us who live through this will find every image of an isolated person in a residential space to be an echo of our own quarantines for the rest of our lives. A woman frantically washes her hands over and over, then dances, splattering the washing water against the drywall of her apartment. Another woman, in the midst of a respiratory pandemic, stops her dancing to throw her shirt back, revealing the tactile flesh of her ribcage under which we can see her heaving, exhausted lungs. A man dances in isolation in a cold and flat morning light then is lit by an incandescent bulb as night falls, and then back to morning. All of these people are alone. All of them are dancing through sickness, unaware of each other, seeming to dance only to themselves. But as it continues, something is created. The dancers choreographed their own routines and shot their segments using iPhones in different countries at different times. But through editing, 
through the same song that propels all of them. The spaces and boundaries between them are erased. One dancer's movement is cut off in the middle, only to be carried through by another. A dancer will begin one motion in the daytime and finish it at night. Certain movements, like a woman's breathing, are looped over and over again, built into the visual and auditory rhythm of the piece the way that a sample becomes part of a song's beat. Isidore tore this town to pieces. A man who made severe judgments. A sawbones, as it were. Yes, sir. If the bones grew wrong, he broke them. Oh, how his son tries to sew it back together. Maybe he'll succeed. And with pretty stitches. You're kidding. People like him only care about themselves. They can't connect things. They certainly can't sew anything. There he is. Look. He came to watch. Watch you foam at the mouth. That means he does care about something other than himself. He will bind us. Pathologic 2's plot revolves around a concept in its world's folklore called an Uderg, a living thing that is many things. A town can be an Uderg, or a people tied by tradition, or an animal raised by a community. A person can be an Uderg if they bear responsibility and memory for others deeply enough within themselves. The Uderg is how one conquers death, by preserving the great interconnected being, such that even if parts of it die, they live on in the indelible imprint they have had on the whole. Everything is of equal value. Everything is pregnant with connections. Even things which have nothing in common. Everything has the potential to be connected. This is the way things reacquire meaning. All that surrounds us is a living organism with its own blood flow and metabolism. Strasbourg 1518 is the creation of an Uderg through editing, a stitching together of disparate and isolated individuals into a single thing. The dancers become indistinct from one another and from the song, as Mika Levi and those moving to her music find their edges blurring, their sounds and motions echoing and presaging one another. The film recognizes that isolation does not cut one off from the living whole entirely, that isolation and the suffering of disease can become shared and unifying experiences. It recognizes that a whole, once broken, can be sewn together in new ways. This is why it's perhaps the first work since I went into lockdown that has broken through that haze. The context that I can't ignore with other art is the meaning here. It's the first film about the pandemic, where the things I can't avoid bringing to other works are the things I'm supposed to bring to this one. I've had a hard time doing what I do because I can't shut out the world outside the screen. Strasbourg 1518 wants me to bring that world in with me. While other works of art struggle to be understood as intended in the current time, Strasbourg 1518 could only exist in it. Strasbourg 1518 aired on TV, then was accessible through a web player and the BBC's phone app. I don't doubt that the movie would be beautiful in the theater, but it would lose meaning. Watching it at home, knowing that your space and the performers are not so different, being unable to let it simply exist in a vacuum is core to the work. You become one of the dancers in your own way, moved by the same music, caught up in their rhythms. You come to the film as a being alone and apart, and you are stitched into the whole. It could only exist here, now, the type of world in which you could see Strasbourg 1518 in the theater is not the world in which it could be made. This is the reason why Strasbourg 1518 is my favorite film of the year thus far. 
It's perhaps the only work of art I've been able to approach completely on its own terms, which I've been able to view and experience as intended. If we make it through this, sane and intact, the sense of community and continuity that Strasbourg 1518 articulates is going to show us how. Not through any simple positivity. The movie isn't just saying that if you're alone you should dance to feel good, but because it recognizes how isolation changes what it is to be human. It recognizes that we are cut off from the body that we used to be, but also that a new body is forming, one being sewn together digitally. Like Pathologic, it's a work whose meaning depends on you being an active participant in criticism, but its subject isn't a grand and permanent notion like death itself, but the here, the now. Strasbourg 1518 cannot meaningfully outlive the present time, and it forces you to stop and consider that present. Where other works of art offer escape or distraction, it gives you something joyous and beautiful that could only be made in this time of disease and isolation. It knows that it is in the midst of death, and that there's still life to be found.